This is a Chronicle podcast, bringing you ideas in the service of medicine. From the Chronicle podcast system, this is the NPC podcast of the National Pharmaceutical Congress for February 15, 2023. The NPC podcast is where we discuss and consider the pharma industry's purpose, process and people, and today, we'll continue the healthcare conversation. This program is presented in cooperation with Impress, Canada's next generation commercial partner. The industry is rapidly evolving, and Impress is designed to help you evolve with it. Learn more about Impress tailored best-in-class solutions at www.impress.com. Our guest today is Carl Frank, Managing Director at Bayshore Healthcare. Carl will join your hosts, Jim, Mark, and Mitch. And to start today's conversation, here's Mitch Shannon, CEO of Chronicle Companies. Welcome back to the NPC podcast from the National Pharmaceutical Congress. I'm your podcast co-host, Mitch Shannon, up here in our historic podcast, Gondola, where the ushers and the cleaning staff never venture. This is where we'll find Jim Shea, General Manager at the Council for Continuing Pharmaceutical Education in Montreal. Jim, I understand you've been negotiating for some time off from the podcast. Is that true? Yes, uh, I've negotiated with myself to take some time. And I think I understand the concept of time off, but I'm going to step back. I'm going to apply the scientific method over the next month and you know, just uh, do some testing on that. Hmm. Interesting. Well, you'll have some uh, reports for us when you come back. You are coming back. Well, I'll, we'll see. We'll see. All right. And someone who doesn't understand the concept of time off is Mark McElwain, the pharmaceutical industry consultant and life sciences expert. Mark, thank you for keeping your shoulder to the wheel all these uh, many episodes. Thanks, Mitch. We haven't booked our tickets yet. Well, we will likely be heading up to Sudbury for a quick trip next week. I guess that doesn't count, though, does it? Well, it counts if you're from Sudbury or love somebody from Sudbury or have some kind of ties to Sudbury, but I would have to say uh, in general. It's winter up there, you know? Yeah, the temperature differential between Toronto and Sudbury over the next few weeks is going to be marked. <laughs> Let's put it that way. When you come back to Toronto, it'll be like going to the tropics. But yeah, if we're going to be real, uh, no, no, Sudbury doesn't count. But anyway, we are your podcast hosts known as Jim, Mark, and Mitch because all the inventive brand names were already taken such as Porter Airlines and Bonanza Sirloin Pit. Let's make room in the gondola for a man who has two first names and no last name, kind of like myself. Here's Carl Frank. Carl, come on in. Uh, thank you, Mitch. I was just listening to all the whining about all the weather in Toronto and Sudbury. And, you know, my frame of reference, I grew up in Edmonton and I spent my first two years at a pharmacy in Yellowknife. So I have a completely different perspective than all of you. And, and I, I just want to say, just quit your whining. We've had a great, great winter. I agree. I think we can end the podcast right here. We've already learned more about you than we uh, we, we could have imagined. <laughs> but let's let's carry on. You are the managing director of uh, Bayshore Healthcare. Can you tell our listeners a little bit more about this uh, very interesting company and its current vision? Yeah, certainly. You know, as a healthcare company, we've been in Canada for we're a Canadian company, and for over fifty five years, we're a, a dynamic healthcare company focused on supporting a broad aspect of community health care, including home care, community infusion, and our patient support programs for pharmaceuticals, uh, both specialty drugs and medical devices. And, you know, at Bayshore, culture is, is really important to us. And we believe a combination of really passionate, empowered healthcare uh, workers and leaders in caring in all the patients, combined with enhancement of digital technology, really will lead to exceptional uh, patient health outcomes for, for patients and their families. And so that's really, a, in a nutshell, of uh, the type of company we have. Carl, it's Mark. So we're not in an elevator, but how does Bayshore Healthcare differentiate itself from your competitors? Well, we're, I think in a lot of the cases, we're a healthcare company first and foremost. And I think, you know, the history of nursing, uh, that really forms our cultural advantage and starts with our people. We have over 18,000 employees and, and culture for us is important. It shows up in how we manage our, our patients, remaining agile and supporting all aspects of care. And so whether it's, uh, you know, infusion, home care, therapy, medical device support or our patient support programs. It's just the way we manage and, and, and care for patients that, that makes the difference. And, and we like to tell stories, you know, that gives us meaning to, to everything that we do. And, and that's what matters to us. 
because we're broad, I think we, we're able to leverage a lot of the strengths in some of our other uh, teams in home care, care path, uh, hospital transitional care. And so that helps us with staffing for our care coordinators and our case managers. So we have over 5,000 nurses leveraging the clinical expertise in pharmacy and nursing from other areas of the business really uh, allows us to differentiate ourselves and exceed in some of those more difficult uh, therapeutic areas. And then digital innovation, uh, we're quite dynamic in how we're approaching uh, digital technology and, and innovation in all parts of the business. And we share that right across. So it's been, uh, it's been very exciting to see the changes over the years. So we often ask our guests about how the COVID-19 pandemic affected their workplace. So how did the pandemic affect things at Bayshore, especially in the early days? Yeah. Like everybody, it was just a, a incredibly stressful time. Um, you know, it's it's funny we we'd always been operating with a heavy remote workforce, so the technology was actually quite seamless for us in the transition. Um, but one of the biggest things uh, was uh, PPE for all of our staff. You can imagine we were buying for all of our uh, colleagues in, uh, in other parts of the business, and we learned you know to buy in uh, containers from China and other places to be able to source globally as there was uh, increasing demand and increasing costs uh, across the way. So that was really interesting times. I think uh, our pharmacies and distribution facilities, uh, as well as our clinics, had to remain open. So that that was really important to understand and make sure our infection prevention and control policies and procedures were up to speed. We actually split our pharmacy teams and distribution teams into, into two teams. One team would work from home and the other would be on site. So if we had a, a breakout, then we could actually mobilize the other team to come in. And uh, fortunately, we didn't have to swap the teams, but we had that capability. So there are a lot of things that were really interesting. I think as an industry, um, when I look at all of the infusion providers, this is something we're, we're quite proud of as an industry. I think Bioscript, Inamar, McKesson, ourselves, we got together pretty early on recognizing that, you know, if we have a staff shortage or a clinic went down, we didn't want patients to, to go without care. And we made an agreement to uh, to share our clinic space, uh, and it happened just a few times overall. I think we all did a great job managing through. So overall, that was pretty important for us to work as one industry to support patient care. And I think uh, we we adapted to a completely changing uh, scenario quite well overall. Yeah, that's an amazing story. It's it's phenomenal. Congrats on doing that. Other than your experience in Yellowknife, uh, you also have a degree in pharmacy. So how has your education impacted you in your career? Well, the pipeline is incredible in, in this space. I love it. Since I've been with Bayshore, it's been 11 years now, and I've used my continuing education more in this part of my career than I did in the, the 20 years prior in retail pharmacy. And it's more about uh, just the exciting new opportunities in pharmaceuticals and the change in all of the innovation that's happening that I love to keep up and, uh, and doing continuing education, attending conferences, uh, gives a clinical context of the patients in the therapeutic area to help design and launch the plans uh, for pharmaceuticals in the marketplace. So it's really important to be able to speak clinically, I think with our pharmacy nursing teams, uh, whether you're talking to specialists or even the medical teams and the pharmaceutical partners. So it's been very interesting and uh, rewarding as a pharmacist. Amazing. Now, you've obviously adapted to our new reality, the early days of meeting the needs of your patients. Um, so how is virtual work and virtual teams, all, how's that all working out for you right now? Yeah, it's a work in progress. I, I think we're all in that space where, you know, the uh, the unemployment rate is the lowest it's ever been. And you know, people have choice. And, you know, there's a lot of good things that came from the remote experience um, that I, I don't think will ever go back. And even though there are some, there are some pressures to go back, I think culture and trying to retain our culture and connect with people, you do need to see them in an office environment or a social environment of some sort of thing. So it's that combination. People love working from home and, and many of them have moved away from the cities out to the rural areas. So trying to get back to the office is more challenging for them. They love embracing technology to work in a remote workforce. They love the fact they don't have to commute. So all of these things, uh, using technology and having flexibility of work is really empowering for them. Um, and they feel much better uh, overall. And so as, as business leaders, you kind of have to embrace that, but you also have to be able to connect. So you know, thinking about how do you set up team meetings, uh, you know, a couple times a month, we, we, we have people come in as teams and just so we can connect with them, you know, because we're all, 
uh, scheduling with technology, trying to find space in people's calendars has been really challenging. So we've gone to sort of uh, uh, trying to do a standard 15 minute meeting to, to allow people to have gaps in their uh, schedules for, you know, quick chats and those sorts of things when you, you can see somebody's available or, you know, things like uh, having a lunch break or, um, you know, giving people flexibility. Um, so that's really important. We're also experimenting with a four-day work week in some areas where it makes sense, you know, where people can work. If you're a call center agent, if, if somebody's having to support patients in Newfoundland all the way to Vancouver Island, you know, the, um, the longer days would be beneficial, but you do need a break. So being able to share with uh, some of your colleagues would be helpful. So it's, it's about, um, you know, understanding the, uh, the use of technology and embracing that and, and also making sure that you retain your culture. That whole balance is really important. Yeah, well, that's very interesting because you opened up talking about culture and certainly it sounds like you're walking the talk with that too, because everybody needs their own individual way of working and working best. So that that's great to hear. It sounds like a great place to work. Yeah, I think the younger demographics too, they want flexibility in their workplace. And I really think uh, for us also, we've been, uh, we've been growing throughout the pandemic and having to hire people. We have a much broader area now to be able to hire from because you're not tied to the office. And, and so you're able to hire from uh, right across the country. And, and so that's been really important as well to grow the remote workforce. You're listening to Carl Frank of Bayshore Healthcare here on the NPC podcast. So just carrying on from uh, your discussion with Jim, I guess we're going to turn philosophical for a minute, uh, Carl. Two words for you, leadership and vision. How does that apply to uh, the initiatives you've uh, undertaken at Bayshore? From a healthcare company, we're really focused on service, healthcare services. And so we really focus on those pharmaceuticals and medical devices, products that require a level of service. And I think that's really important to set that overall direction. It's also really important to understand um, what is the feedback from the field. And it's really important to listen to your people. So we really build from the ground up. We involve our staff, frontline and managers to provide constant feedback. And as I said before, you know, it's about empowering our leaders and making sure that they have the ability to make decisions and the right decisions when the time comes. So I think that's where, you know, you set the overall objectives, you listen to your people, and then you can get more granular as to what, what initiatives and what focus you have when you're, you're planning for the future. Carl, it's Mark again. So what strikes me, your company is quite spread out across the country, across different settings and functions. So how do you ensure that your various teams are aligned with your vision and goals? Well, I think the fact is that I like to take a really open and simple view of business. It's a complex business and we have so many different areas. And as you say, you know, nationally as a business, you want to make sure that you manage people and you, you empower your people. And that's one of the first things that you, you think about. So I, I usually look at three big things and I talk to my people about this, that what's really important in leadership is empowering your people because nobody wants to be told what to do. People want to have the ability to make decisions that, that are right for their business. I think the second thing is, is around accountability and accountability is not a bad word. It, it really starts with what does great look like? You know, making sure that people have a, a P&L or KPIs that they can measure success. So they, you know, they'll manage towards that and they'll make sure that they're managing their people as well. And then finally, I, I think it's really important to have pace and operate with a sense of pace. You know that the business isn't going to wait and your competitors aren't going to wait. So you, you want to make sure that you're responsive and agile in everything that you do. And as you become a much bigger organization, let me tell you, that becomes more difficult. You know, we're 18,000 people. We don't feel like that large of an organization, I think, from a cultural perspective, but it is uh, something we're, we're really aware of to make sure that we remain agile and remain an empowering company for our people. Well, let's build on that speed of change because your business space seems to be evolving more quickly than some other parts of healthcare. And I'm just wondering how you stay up to date on the latest trends and developments in uh, retail and specialty pharmacy. Yeah, I, I mentioned earlier about continuing education, and I'm always, it was, it's funny over the Christmas holidays. In this industry, what's nice, and unlike retail, when, of course, you have to be in the stores during Christmas, your busiest time of the year. And we get to slow down a little bit when our partners close up shop for a few weeks and there's no shipping. And I have the ability to sort of look at things, maybe do a continuing education. And I, I did a lot of that over the two weeks of Christmas. 
I love to connect to people in the industry. And so it's, it's really important to connect with associations like the Neighborhood Pharmacy Association, CAPDM, LSO, and, and other Canadian organizations, as well as conferences like Asambia and NASP in the U.S. Uh, really specialized on specialty pharmacy and understanding the latest trends and innovations that are coming south of the border. So that's really how I like to stay up to date. And of course, now that there's so many different publications and uh, newsletters that are coming in your inbox, you can get carried away with all that information. And but but that does allow you to keep up to speed with a lot of the things that are happening in the industry. Yeah, there's never a dull moment. It's so dynamic. It's it's very interesting. So it's Jim here again. Can you share any interesting challenge that you've personally faced uh, in your career and how you overcame it? I have to say, I, I guess I'd rather have it in a, in a growing business, the stress of a growing business than the stress of a business that's facing financial challenges. But it's stressful in a, in a growing business because you know the cash demands on the business and the demands of technology and investment. That's very stressful. And over the last decade, it comes down to looking at your margins and your cost pressures on one hand. And we face those significantly in the pharmaceutical industry, especially at, at pharmacy and wholesale. And then there's significant growth. That balance, you really have to reinvest your profits back into the business to continue to grow and making sure that you're investing in the right things and your people, processes, and systems to meet the needs of the customers and stay agile. And so that's really uh, important for you know, the challenges that we've had over the last uh, period of growth. Yeah, well, with 18,000 people employed, uh, yes, <laughs> that's got to be pretty serious. That's a big company. <laughs> that's a big company. So um, do you have any success stories about your experiencing and managing and developing pharmacy teams? I love seeing people grow. And I, I think it's funny how you change as a leader over time. I think you start out to, as a doer and, and then you look at things a little bit differently as you become larger and you start thinking about how do I make sure that my people are empowered and able to develop as leaders. So what happens is you, you start allowing people to, to take on, make decisions and make sure that you step out of the way. In a lot of the cases, that's what I do. I find if I get involved in operations now and I've been uh, away from operations for a while and you start getting into the nitty gritty of operations, people look at you funny. And are saying, what are you doing? You don't, you don't know. You're slowing me down. You don't know what I'm doing here. And and so it's a lot of it is sort of like trusting your people and relying on them to make decisions. And in some cases, making mistakes, you you sort of they're going to have to learn, right, and take accountability for their own mistakes. But that allows them to grow. And it's a feeling of pride that you have with people when you start to see them develop as leaders. That uh, that makes it all rewarding. Yeah. Well, that's uh, again, it's all about the culture you've been talking about. So, Carl, as we wind down the podcast, we're going to invite you to play our word association game. So just go ahead and say the first thing that comes to mind in response to each of the following phrases or words. So are you ready? I'm ready. Okay, cool. Pharmacy technology. Digital. Risk management. Balance. Pharmaceutical supply chain logistics. Efficiency. Healthcare marketing. Pride. Vendor negotiation. Partnership. Well, that's a lot of points for that one. We were uh, secretly awarding points, a ton of points for that, eh, gentlemen? So yeah, it's uh, it's time now to put on your soothsayer's hat because we're going to be uh, entering the prognostication corner. Now, Mitch, correct me if I'm wrong, but we're buying all the southeast corners for every nhl broadcast going forward right naming it the prognostication corner with the new digital boards oh i like that yeah i like that very much that's sports marketing that could be a whole episode yeah absolutely absolutely so I, i'm looking forward to that so i guess it comes down to this now carl uh what kind of bold predictions can you make about the life sciences industry going forward for the next 12 24 i don't know whatever you like time period yeah, well, um, I don't think uh, PMPRB is going to get resolved. Um, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure if this is full, but I just see the rise of cell and gene therapy and messenger RNA. Messenger RNA in, in particular over the pandemic has seen a, an incredible evolution in, at pace. 
And cell and gene therapy, you know, we're going to start to see curative therapies, I think in rare disease in particular, and maybe some of the hematological cancers, you know, in much the same way that we are eradicating hep C. So that's really exciting, you know, thinking about how we could play a part in supporting those patients and supporting the launch of those types of products and, you know, innovative models, they all have unique challenges. And that's what makes it really exciting. I think hospitals obviously over capacity and we're not building hospitals at any rate to meet the needs of the aging population. And so, so much more will be outsourced in uh, community-based healthcare. We're seeing that in infusions in, in pharmaceuticals and that has happened over the 20 years, 25 years, you know, Alzheimer's, we're just hopeful we're going to, we're going to have some type of therapy that's effective and some, there's some great innovation just around the corner. So those things will be really exciting. And then the usual, you know, oncology is just undergoing incredible innovation with personalized precision, next generation sequencing and targeted therapy. I think, you know, you've already seen the benefits of the last 20 years of innovation with improving five-year survival rates, and that's going to continue on in the number of years in the future. So just so much uh, opportunity and and, um, it's just exciting when you start to see all the things that are coming down the pipeline. Yep, there's a, a lot of good ideas that are going to turn into miracles shortly. It's amazing. Absolutely. What a hopeful uh, note to uh, wrap things up on. So, Carl, thanks for stopping by and spending some time with us today. Stay well in 2023. Yeah, you as well. Great to talk to you guys. And to our listeners, thank you for joining us. We will speak to you again next week. If you've got questions for Carl, just send an email to health at chronicle.org. As always, We invite your comments about today's conversation. And if you attach your question as a voice clip, you might just become part of a future episode. We hope you enjoyed today's NPC podcast. If you did, please like it, rate it, recommend it, and remember to share it with your network. Find us wherever you get your podcasts, or just ask your smart device to play the National Pharmaceutical Congress podcast on Audible or TuneIn Radio or Spotify. The NPC podcast is presented in cooperation with Impress, Canada's next generation commercial partner. Check them out at www.impress.com. I'm your announcer, Leona Void, speaking. And I thank you for all the lovely Valentines you listeners sent me yesterday. This podcast was produced by Jeremy Visser, assisted by Amy Elder and Spencer Eng. Research for this program came from Cristela Tello Ruiz, and we wish her a happy birthday today. The musical theme is performed with flamboyant confidence by the NPC Podcast Orchestra, under the direction of Maestro Melville Milbrook. We'll speak again next week.